What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Low Kick MMA Weekly Roundup. I'm your host, Ryan Galloway, and joining me is Jordan Ellis. Jordan, how you doing, mate? I'm doing well. I'm, I'm fresh. I'm refreshed. I've had an early night's sleep as well. I was in bed by, you know, one o'clock um, last night, which is a rarity for myself, but I know you were up all the, all the way through the night, so how was that for you? Yeah, I had to taste a bit of what it's like to watch the UFC in the UK there where you stay up until 5 a.m. in the morning or God knows what hour. And I'll tell you what, I, I have so much more adoration for people that do that because at 11 p.m. when the prelims were starting, I was like, oh, I feel a bit tired. Um, you know, rallied on and the fights were just really impressive. So thank God they were good fights and kept me up because if they were boring fights, I, I could definitely have found myself falling asleep. I know, and there was lots of finishes as well. Like, there's nothing worse when you, you're stuck in that time zone and everything's just going to the judges and, and it's just it's it's not going quick enough for you. So, yeah, it, it worked out quite well for yourself, but it's mm. great that everyone got a bit of taste of that. Nice for us UK fans and the European fans to get a nice early card, especially one so big. And, you know, it's, it worked out for most people. So, yeah, it was a fun, fun fight. And you know, let's speak about them now. Yeah, we'll jump straight into the main event because it was obviously the biggest th thing on the whole card and uh, especially for a lot of reasons that we'll get into. Um, but first, we'll just touch on the performance itself and Khabib Nurmagomedov just looked sensational, didn't he? He just looked fantastic. On the feet even, he was standing there striking with Gaethje and while it might have been because he couldn't back him up to the cage and get the takedown, it was so effective in wearing Gaethje out and you could just see the fatigue on him. Even three minutes into the fight, Gaethje looked so tired and he looked like he didn't have a lot to offer in his gas tank going forward. And I think for Gaethje, the, the game plan was clearly to circle around the fence and not get put on the fence, circle away. And he stuck to it, but that might have been his downfall. What do you think? Yeah, I've got my opinions on on Gaethje's performance, which I don't I don't think it was a good performance at all. But I want to focus more just right now on Khabib and how sensational he was because he he really was he he he's shown progression. You know, fourth round submission, third round submission, second round submission. He, he's getting better. So to see him, you know. Uh, put in that performance against people like a lot of people were saying this is the toughest test of his career and it's not something I particularly agreed with but it's definitely one of them Um, I thought Gaethje had he did well for a little while but it, it was all just a bit too frantic he was landing shots and I think the one thing that a lot of people thought is that Gaethje's got the power to knock him out with one punch and it was clear that uh, Nurmagomedov, as as much as he's a brilliant wrestler and, and he doesn't really take a lot of punches, I think he can take them. I think he's got a brilliant chin. I don't think there's an issue at all there, but he just looked flawless. He when he got the takedowns, he was jumping straight to mount. There was just and then he was he was uh, immediately attacking with submissions. It was almost like he wanted to get the fight over and done with and get retirement done because he was just so eager to just take take this guy out. Um, so on in terms of what Khabib did, it was just absolutely flawless. It you know, you ca I can't give him any high, more high praise right now. For me, he's the lightweight goat. You know, quite clearly the lightweight goat. I think he tied the record yesterday. He's he's very clearly the best. And then onwards from that, a lot of people will have him in the goat conversation. Full stop. So you know, just flawless from Khabib, and it was um you know sad to see him go at the end, but brilliant stuff, and it's been great watching him. Yeah, I'll get to the goat talk and that uh, in a second. But first, like you said, Khabib, he, he was looking for the submissions. He got to mount at the end of the first round straight to the armbar. He wasn't interested in sitting there and doing the ground and pound how he usually would and tiring people out. And I think a lot of that might have to do with the fact he knew. And Gaethje had said himself, this isn't new news. This is no surprise to anyone. Gaethje had said if he gets put on his back, he's going to be in trouble. So I think Khabib knew that once he got him on his back, he could pretty much do what he wanted. And... The, the transition from his back to mount to set up that triangle was just beautiful at the end there. And obviously, Gaethje tapped, but the referee didn't see it, and he went to sleep. It was just a bit of a shame there, but it's it's fine. You know, he, he'll be fine. It's not as bad as getting knocked out, I suppose. But Khabib just looked fantastic, like you've said. And then he goes and he announces his retirement. And I fully understand why, because if you're someone like Khabib who did everything with their father, they, they, he's... All his fighting was with his father. His father is involved in everything. And now his father's gone. It's kind of like, from his perspective, why why would he want to continue that? Maybe he does. Maybe I don't know. Obviously, I don't know what he's thinking. But maybe he does want to continue that. But I can see why he would quit 
without the lack of his father being around. And especially if it's his mother's wishes, he's not, he doesn't seem like the type of person who's going to come back in a little bit, like once they build up another fight with GSP or something. I think this is definitely Khabib done. And what a way to go out on top, 29-0. and 0, And yeah, flawless performance in his final fight. I think he'd, he'd be likely to stay around if that, that GSP fight was, you know, kind of a certain. But right now it looks very unlikely. And Khabib, um, he's, he's made it very clear he doesn't want to spend any time around Conor McGregor. And let's be honest, um, it, it, Conor McGregor is going to be the next contender, you know, providing he gets past Poirier. I fancy him, him to do that. And I just don't think he's got any interest in, in rematching Poirier or McGregor. The options just aren't really there for him. If GSP, they could make that fight, but then Dana White saying we'll make it, but only a 155. But GSP's not making 155. I, I don't know what world these people are living in that thinks that think he's going to make that fight, and then also that it would be competitive. We've seen Khabib had re- he had bad trouble making the weight. You know, there's a bit of controversy as to whether he made the weight in terms of that video that was circulating. So why wouldn't you do that fight at 170? It makes no sense. So. I just feel like that fight's pretty much off the table. And then besides that, um, no one else is really there. He's beat Connor and Poirier. Tony Ferguson, he doesn't really fancy him to get back to title contenders there. It, it's, it makes sense for me. And I do agree with you in the fact that he'll stay retired now and he'll go off and he'll he'll live his life in Dagestan. It'll, he's, he's, he's made his mark on the sport. He's done enough. And 29 now, as someone who's a bit of a um, perfectionist, 30, you know, would sound so much better from someone like myself. You know, I don't like them odd numbers and 30, you know, rounding up is, is really nice. But besides that, besides it being an odd number, I think he, I think he's had the perfect career. Yeah, and I, I, I was watching an interview that Eri Hawani did with George St. Pierre just after Khabib announced his retirement. And uh, George said that he himself, he said he wouldn't be able to make 55. He said he could make it, but he would be shallow himself. So he didn't want to do it there. But I do think that, if Khabib said he wanted the fight and George at 165, I guarantee you the UFC would be happy to make that fight now because Khabib's not going to fight again. But if for some reason Khabib was to come back, which I don't think he does, and this is just speculation because he's definitely not going to do it, I can guarantee you. But if he said, I'm going to come back and fight George and it's going to be at 165, the UFC will make that fight. There is no way they don't make that fight because could you imagine the spectacle and the amount of pay-per-view buys that it would do if Khabib, coming off a performance like that against someone that people did think was going to be his toughest challenge and just proved to not be true, right? Like, let's be honest, the the wrestling of Gaethje wasn't even a factor in this because uh, he, he, the, the problems he had were mostly to do with his gas tank and his lack of a ground game from the bottom. So uh, I don't think the wrestling was much of a factor. And I always saw Khabib winning this. However, I did might maybe think it would be a, li- a, bit, a little more competitive than it was. Um, but yeah, we've, we've already spoken enough about the actual fight. In terms of the GOAT talk, I want to leave that until we get to new- news later because there is some other factors to do with that. I think everyone knows what I'm referring to, but we'll wait till I speak about that then. Um, but as far as a title picture goes at 155, as much as it does pain me, I think they're going to do it Conor versus Poirier for that belt. And I, I don't like to see it because Conor, his last fight was at 70 and before that he lost to Khabib. And it's he hasn't really fought at 155 to earn himself this title shot. But I understand why they're doing it. Here's the money fight. He's the biggest star in the UFC. If he wants to fight for a title, there's a vacant one now. Uh, I feel like that Poirier-Conor fight will be for the title. Or, alternatively, they do Gaethje versus Conor. Yeah, I think... Um... For me, I, I know he did fight at 170, but he fought, he fought a, a 155 fighter, just upper, upper weight. So he's coming off a win. Poirier's coming off a win. They're pretty much the only two. You know, it's the only one that really makes sense unless you want to yank someone and put them against Gaethje. But in my opinion, Gaethje, he, 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 looked, he looked pretty poor last night. He, he didn't do anything right, like in terms of, you know, you don't want to kick a man while he's down. But I was so surprised that he had literally no ground game. And he... he like Khabib was just jumping straight to mountain. You know, you can have a go with Conor McGregor all you want and call him Matt Tapper because he's been subbed a few times. He did not make it that easy. Khabib had to fight for everything he got in terms of, you know, submissions and submission attempts. Against Gaethje, he jumped straight to mount. He was pulling. It was just, he might as well be being playing with a, like a little a doll or, a, you know, one of them dolls you see people using jujitsu on. Because Gaethje had nothing. So I don't see how Gaethje can think he's he's going to get another shot after that, you know, straight away anyway, because he called out McGregor post-fight. So I do think, you know, 
people don't like McGregor and he's also I am a bit worried that if he gets the belt he might hold up the division and, and lightweight's so fun you, you don't want to see that so I think that'll be the fight. I think Gaethje needs to go back. He needs he needs to you know face someone like Dan Hooker. He needs to get some more momentum. I feel like anyone who's facing him now should just try and drag him to the mat and just because he's clearly got no jujitsu yeah. skills at all. And and yes, Nate Diaz said post fight you know on the he ripped them all saying they've got no jujitsu. But Poirier and McGregor, I, f- I think they hang tough for a, for a little while. But you know an extra minute in that round one, Gaethje was getting subbed then as well. So it was just. It, it, it weren't great from Gaethje, but you know you don't want to take away from Khabib because he was relentless and that was the best we've ever seen him. But I was just disappointed in Gaethje, and that for that reason I don't think he's in the picture right now. Besides yeah, well, that, you've got you've also got Chandler and Tony. So if you want to take that one on, yeah, I mean Chandler and Tony is is a good fight to make, and I think it will be the fight they make next for those two guys. Um, one thing I do want to touch back on now, I do think a rematch between Gaethje and Ferguson looks completely different because of the fact we've now seen Gaethje has nothing to offer off his back. And game planning for the fight against Gaethje initially for Ferguson, he was coming off his game plan against Khabib. He'd been preparing for Khabib for like, Khabib for like a year, trying to work out his striking pedigree and not go to the ground because you don't want to go to the ground, Khabib. It doesn't matter if you're Tony Ferguson or whoever. Like, your game plan is to stay on the feet. And I think that kind of hindered his approach to Gaethje because he'd been training for a wrestler who he didn't want to go to the ground with. But if he game plans to take Gaethje to the ground and submit him, I, I, I promise you, if they rematch anytime soon and before Gaethje maybe makes leaps and bounds of improvements, I see... Tony Ferguson winning that fight by submission because he's going to look to get Gaethje to the ground and half of Tony's submission game isn't even on the ground. It's setting up neck attacks while he's standing and it was just something he didn't do in the fight against Gaethje. He just sat, sat there and boxed with him, which was an awful idea and obviously he got smashed. Like, no one's denying Tony Ferguson lost that fight. Um, you can be his biggest fan, but he, he lost every single second of that fight aside from the uppercut. But I think in a rematch... It would be a quite a different fight. I don't really want to say it, see it though. I think the Chandler versus Ferguson fight is fantastic um, because it's a showcase for Chandler if he can pull that one off. And if Ferguson can get that one, he's right back in a title shot, in my opinion. He's had one loss. He was on a 12-win streak before. The division's wide open now. And I think this is a lot like light heavyweight where now that Yarn's the champion at light heavyweight, we're going to see that belt pass around a bit. And I, I feel like lightweight could be the exact same. Even if McGregor gets it, I don't see McGregor smashing everyone in that division. He give, he's given up a lot of not anymore, but like I don't know. I I I don't know. I don't have a really good take on that right now. But I just I think that belt will change hands a little bit. Yeah, I, th- I think it's wide open. I think they're all capable of beating each other. Um, UFC clearly want to give Chandler a push, and if they're not really content on you know putting all the faith in in McGregor that he wants to fight, he's already speaking about fighting Pacquiao after he's fought. Poor so why would you want to hold up the division? I could see them maybe making Chandler against Ferguson, or if Ferguson doesn't agree, Chandler against Poirier for the title um, to keep the division alive and moving and, and things like that. So it is wide open. I think Conor Poirier makes the most sense to me, be just because they have both they are coming off wins and and you know things like that. In terms of what you said about Tony against Gaethje, I just feel like. Everyone's being clouded by the fact that um, Gaethje is hyped to be a, a wrestler and a Division One All American, and then they just don't even think, "Oh, let's get him to the ground," because they think, "Why would I try and wrestle with someone of that caliber when I can just punch with them?" Even though he's he's a brilliant, you know, boxer as well. So it's Gaethje is a problem, but I think that's a massive hole, and I think anyone who's fighting him now should be looking at that because as impressive as Gaethje, as um, Khabib was, it was very easy. And Gaethje made it very easy on the floor. There was no, there was no defense. And I'm sure someone like Tony, someone like Nate Diaz, are kind of licking their lips at that, thinking all I have to do is get him to the floor, and, and he'll just, he'll just fall into my triangle, or he'll fall into my armbar. So it's very interesting times. And Gaethje hopefully realizes that that gap and, and goes and works on it because he's he's very clearly able to adapt and and come back a better fighter. We've seen him lose to Poirier and Alvarez on the feet. Then he puts on a boxing clinic against Tony Ferguson. So he's very capable of going away, fixing some holes and, and coming back and you know win a title. Um but not not right now. I, I just don't think he should be going straight into them big fights. We'll see. I, I can tell you one thing. It'll definitely be McGregor, be McGregor fighting for that title. The UFC is not going to skip over any opportunity they can to put McGregor in a title fight. And probably it's probably a wise move, right? Because that's how you make the most money for them. And they're a business at the end of the day. We'll jump onto the other fight on the card that had title implications. 
which was the co-main event between Robert Whittaker, the former middleweight champion, and Jared Cannonier, this rising contender that a lot of people were picking to beat Rob here and go straight into a title shot against Izzy. And Whittaker just showcased his skill and his precision striking and uh, his durability at the end there. Not that he wanted to show that, but it was just a pretty impressive showcase for Whittaker, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought it was it was brilliant. I thought he looked much um, even better than he looked against Till. I think he he dominated the fight. Um, I know the judges had it pretty close, but I didn't I didn't have it close at all. I thought I thought it was pretty clear every round really. I know he got a bit hurt at the end, but I think he hurt Cannonier in that round more than Cannonier hurt him definitely. So it was it was um, very impressive. He was just popping that jab all night. He he does that thing where he pops his head to the side and then comes up with a kick. It's just all very nice and tidy and now I'm fully on board for this Izzy rematch I know Izzy might not be feeling it might not be into it but I think Whitaker like this fighting like this he, I feel like he's getting better at the minute I feel like he, he deserves it and I feel like he can give a better account of himself but you know it was it was a brilliant dominant performance against someone who was meant to be a top contender that's two on the bounce now Um, you know I'm back on Whitaker's hype train and I hope he I hope he gets the shot I don't want to see him fight Israel right now. Um, I prefer Israel to go up. But before I get into that, I'll go to the matchup again. And Kananir, I, I think he 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 showed all he had to offer in that first round, right? Like he, the leg kicks, he's, he's power punching, but he was doing big swings and misses. Uh, so I think after that first round, Rob would, just knew what he was looking for, knew what he had to do to win. And you saw in the third round, he just put him down with that head kick. And it was almost all over there. But props to Cannonier for fighting through that because anyone else would have quit there, you know? Like he fully covered... And then Whitaker had his back, and he still managed to get up. And he took the legs out from Whitaker for a second, but obviously it wasn't anywhere near the damage he sustained. But yeah, like I will bring up the judging because I thought it was pretty ridiculous. Like that was clearly a 30 to 87 fight, in my opinion. And even if you're going to give the first round Cannonier, I could see the third round being a 10 8 Whitaker anyway, because Whitaker just put him down and smashed him eyes on the ground. Like, uh, had that have gone to Cannonier, that would have been a controversy and a half. Um, but the one round that people were giving to Cannonier, which blew my mind, was the second round. The first round was the one I could see going either way. But the judges gave the round, the second round to Cannonier. I just didn't understand that. No, I, I don't get it really at all. I, I was watching the fight and I was, I was um, a couple of my friends around and I was saying to them, it's difficult because how do you score leg kicks? Um, you know, some people you know, they were landing and they were impressive, but I think a lot of fighters just think I'll eat that so I can punch you in the face. And then what is is a punch in the face worth less than a leg kick? And how do you work? So it is a it's a for me in terms of like my personal judging at home, I do find them hard to score and how damaging are they? Because you're not going to knock someone out with a leg kick very rarely anyway. It's more of accumulative damage, and you get the benefits of it down the line. Um, so it, it was a difficult one in terms of, I, it's it's not horrible to give him one round in there. I wouldn't have given him the second. I thought as the fight progressed, Whitaker got more dominance. Um, so if any round, it was the first. But in my personal opinion, I didn't give him that. I didn't think Cannonier looked anywhere near Whitaker's level. I thought he, I thought he was just, as the fight went on, he just, he was just getting drowned. And if that was a five-round fight, he would have lost you by um, TKO. So it was very impressive from Whitaker. He just showed he's the man. At middleweight, he's the number one contender. Um, as you said, I understand why you don't want to see him fight Izzy again, but there's really nowhere for what Whitaker to go now. Anywhere from here is downwards, and why would he do that? You know, he's a fighter in his prime. So, uh, interesting time at lightweight, at middleweight. It's it's all it's all going on. Yeah, I I just think there hasn't been enough time for me to expect anything different from Whitaker against Izzy. Maybe his mindset's better, but I just think skill wise, um. Is this just a problem? I think if he had a, another couple... Because I, I think Israel was talking about turning around quite quickly. If they do that fight in February, I, I don't like Whitaker's chances. Or March or whenever he said. I feel like he needs a few more months to get ready. If they did that fight in July, I think maybe Whitaker would have like a decent shot. Um, but I, I just don't understand. Like, Whitaker's a problem. And he is a problem for the whole division because he's so high level that he's just going to beat every contender they give him. Like, they could feed him everyone else in that division that's not named Israel Adesanya, and they're just going to, like, be be out, outdone, and Israel's just going to have no one to fight. So the thing I was thinking from this fight is, if Whitaker only wants to fight in uh, March or April, which is fair enough because he's got a kid coming and whatnot, so take the time I've spent it with family. He's definitely earned it. He had a great 2020, you know, uh, two victories against upcoming contenders. 
I think what they could possibly do, if Darren Till gets the win over Hermanson in good style, they pro- he probably jumps the queue and gets Adesanya. Unless the asterisk, Adesanya goes to light heavyweight. Yeah, I think even Hermanson winning that fight, if Hermanson wins and looks good, I think he could get it. I don't think there's any rush. Like, I don't think Whitaker needs to be next. I just think Whitaker's next fight should be for the title. Mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean he's next for Izzy. Izzy could fight Darren Till or Hermanson in the meantime. As a as a Till fan and a, and a scouser, I, I obviously want to see Till in that position, but I feel like he just needs to take his time. And... Um, if he's going to roll over Hamanson and, you know, knock him out in the first round, I don't think that's, you know, enough preparation for a fight like Izzy. So I prefer him to take his time and, and work his way back up. But he, he's such a, you know, he's such a star at this point that the UFC are just, you know, frothing at the mouth thinking about that Izzy fight and the build-up and things like that. So, um... I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Izzy, you know, early next year against one of them guys. Then maybe in the summer against Whitaker, which is you know fine by me, and I'm sure it's fine by Whitaker because he's got you know a family to look after, another baby on the way. You know, he wants more time to prepare and game plan. But for me, for Izzy, second time round, he's a really dangerous fighter because he he's he's been very tricky in his last two fights. He, he's not as easy to hit. He he has made adjustments, and I think it'd be interesting to see how them adjustments play out you know, mm. on the night against Dizzy, but um, I understand why people aren't, you know, clamoring for that fight, not yet anyway. Yeah, I, I, I like what you said there. I didn't even think of that, that uh, Whitaker doesn't have to fight Israel next, but his next fight should be Israel, right? He, he should, doesn't need to be the next person to fight Israel, which I think is great because you can give Israel one of these contenders he hasn't fought, um, which he's probably more enticed Tossing to him because he doesn't want to fight Whitaker again. He just beat him like not not much over a year ago, and then do obviously Rob's next fight in July or June or whenever um, for the title against whoever's got it. If beat Israel or whoever beats him, if that could happen, which I doubt. But anyway, <laughs> we'll jump on to heavyweights now. We had Alexander Volkov versus Walt Harris, and I called this one to a T. Um, so I'm just going to give myself a little pat on the back there. Um, Alexander Volkov just proved too technical and too long and got Walt Harris out of there with a pretty brutal front kick that, um, yeah, I thought it was a low blow for a second, but it wasn't, so he followed it up and put him away. What do you think of that fight? Yeah, it was brilliant. When we spoke, I, I was picking Walt Harris. I thought he might just be able to pick, it might be able to get him, but as the week progressed, I, I changed my mind. I went to Volkov, and it was kind of... Um, as expected, it was just one of them things, and and it was the same reason I picked Whitaker against Cannonier, even though it was a you know a fifty fifty fight um, on the bookmakers. I just thought his experience is high level. You know, he's been at the higher level for longer, and um, he'd be he's beaten people better than Walt Harris the same way Whitaker had beaten people better than Cannonier, and I just thought that'd see him through, and it was. It was one of the night. I don't know if he got a a bonus or not, but he deserved yeah. it because it was it was beautiful. Like, and it, it, when you get them reactions from people from body shots, you just know it's over. And he just he he screamed in pain. He turned away. All the telltale signs that he'd been hit with a, a nasty shot. And and Volkov looks great start to finish. So I think it was always going to come. And um, yeah, brilliant performance in him. Walt Harris for me, he's he's an interesting. Um, Gatekeeper, yeah, he's a gatekeeper. I think he's a, he's one of them good levelers where you can see if you get past Walt Harris, he's a tough guy. You, you you're in the upper echelon then, and I think Volkov, he he deserves to be there. He's a very talented fighter, and he just needs to get over that hump of beating one of the really top guys. You know, the Curtis Blades, you know, someone like Ngannou, something like that, where um he can then go on and challenge for the title because he's not quite there yet, but he's he's very close. Yeah, I agree. And we'll move through the rest of the card quite quickly here and just touch on some highlights. Obviously, the fight before that, we had two debuts uh, in the UFC. Philip Hawes got the win over Jacob Malkoon, who just kind of looked lost in the octagon. He got backed up to the fence, and he just looked like he didn't know where he was. Um, and as soon as he got backed up and put both hands on the fence, I was like, oh, God, this guy doesn't want to be here. Or uh, uh, He just looked nervous, and it obviously cost him because in 19 seconds, he got knocked cold out like, it was awful to look at, um, but props to Hawes for, or Howes or whatever that is for doing that. Like very impressive performance for his debut, and on the main card of such a big pay per view, pretty good showcase spot. Yeah, it was it was amazing that he was even in that spot. Two debutants. Um, uh, the UFC they always baffle me with these things, but you know it's a brilliant, brilliant spot for these two guys, and it was it was there for someone to go and steal the show because I'm sure he got a bonus as well. Um, 
but Jacob Malhoun, he he's Whitaker's training partner, and it felt it felt like someone who'd been kind of bumped up to the main the main show before he was ready for and now good record, but not you know clearly not enough experience to be in the UFC, and it really did show on the night. He got absolutely starched, and uh, I don't know what you do with them from there. Do you give him another shot? Um, Phil Hawes just he just looked too much and. I was actually I was reading through the week that Hawes was the the favourite and then on the night it was DraftKings saying uh, Malhum was so you know so it was, I was very surprised to see someone so green in such a big spot actually be the favourite so I was thinking maybe I was looking forward to speaking to you about Malhum and whether you knew him from because he's Aussie isn't he and mm-hmm. how talented is he because I'd never heard of him. So his grappling is where he really shines. He he has a stellar grappling record. I'm pretty sure he won the Pan Pacific Trials in like 2019 as a purple belt or something like i think i can't remember where you was but he's a very very good grappler that's where he shines he's also got some professional boxing on his record uh i haven't seen any of that so i can't really speak on his striking but i thought in this fight he would be looking to take it to the ground and just execute on his grappling because in his previous fights he hasn't necessarily gotten submissions every fight but he's taking people to the ground and just finish them with strikes so um but he just I, I honestly i think he looked lost in there he just looked like he he didn't he was nervous i don't know if it's nerves um yeah as soon as he got in there he just didn't look like he wanted to be in there and that you just can't go in there with that attitude at this level because you'll get taken out like he was um but i think should he regroup and get another shot he'll probably look to use his grappling which is where he shines and uh hopefully has some success because there's not a lot of young prospects coming out of Australia really right now into the UFC. So for him and uh, one of Whitaker's other teammates, uh, Izzy something, I can't remember, he weighed in f- as a replacement for the first fight on the main card. Uh, he's another one to look out for. He's got a 6-0 record, and he's fought on uh, one of our local promotions here in Australia. And so these guys coming in, like they're looking to make a good name, but in this in this situation, it seems it was early, right? It seems he should have got a few more fights under his belt before he came in here. Um, but Philip Hawes looked fantastic. Keen to see what he does next. Yeah, in terms of you know four and zero in the UFC, that that's that suggests that he's a killer. Basically, that suggests that he's 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 one of the best prospects in in global MMA. Um, it didn't look like that on the night, and um, slow build now. Hopefully, they really do take the time with them. You know. Um, we've seen them rush these prospects. I hope he jumps back down a few levels. If there is a few levels to jump back down, and um, you know, slowly makes his way to the top. But the, someone clearly fancying them to put him in the UFC to start with, mm-hmm. put him in this position on the card as well on this card. So he, he's clearly fancied, and I hope they stick with him. You know, because uh, from what you said, it sounds like he's got a lot more to offer, and hope we see it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we'll get to the women's flyweight bout before that between Lauren Murphy and Lilia Shakarova, who was another one of these big prospects that people had high hopes for coming in here. But to be honest, she looked lost and she looked like uh, she was just too small for the division, maybe. She just didn't look like she had anything to offer. I'm pretty sure her grappling was what she was meant to be uh, a name for. And she had nothing to offer. Murphy obviously pulled off the submission. So what did you think of that fight? Yeah, it was impressive. It was you never know with these people, you know, um, from Eastern Europe and, and they've got a bit of hype and a, and a, you, you you don't know if they're going to take out the top contender in the first fight because that's what Lauren Murphy is. And as we always say, the flyweight division is wide open. Anyone can beat anyone. So it's not that Lauren Murphy, you know, is unbeatable and she's this elite level unbeatable flyweight. Um, you know, just the other girl, Shakarova, just wasn't ready for the for the fight that come at it. She was too small. She just looked outgunned in every area. It was a really tough debut. And, you know, she could have, you know, propelled herself into title contention by beating Murphy, but it's high risk, high reward or and, and things like that. And the risk just didn't pay off this time. She she got battered. She got subbed by someone who's never subbed anyone before. Um, but Lauren Murphy, you know, she showed why she's a top, one of the top contenders. You know, she she basically smacked down the debutants and just said, "Get back in your place." Um, I'm one of the top flyweights in the world, and and she'll go on. She's probably only one or two more fights away from a title shot now. Yeah, and run through this card. The opening fight we had was the long-awaited fight between Magomed Ankalaev and Anku Dalaba, and Ankalaev shut down any doubt that he was the better fighter in this one. Uh, finished Kudalaba in the first round and just put him out cold. He stumbled him, put him on the floor, and finished him with ground and pound. So, very impressive performance. Was that what you expected in this one? Yeah, 100%. I don't know what the, the hype was about this fight. It was a very clear 
that ankle of was going to knock him out in the first fight to me anyway. And whether he was doing the messing about or, or whatever, I don't think it's a, a 50-50 fight. I don't think it was one of the, the more appealing fights on the card. But because of the whole coronavirus, the controversy of the last one, uh, will it happen, won't it happen? Even up until fight day, he was still saying... Kutalaba's corner or someone in the corner was testing positive for coronavirus. So I was just glad to see it get get over and done with. And Ankalaev is, in my opinion, a really bright prospect. Uh, Kutalaba is not quite there yet. And I'd, I I just think this was a stepping stone for Ankalaev. And he, and he proved it and he got a beautiful knockout. It was, you know, quite vicious. And it's always, um, it's oh, it's, it's high high stakes when these light heavyweights start throwing because he was covering up on the floor, but one got through and then he's asleep. And it, it you know it was brilliant. It was it was a brilliant performance by Ankalaev. For sure. And in the featured prelim, we had another knockout right on the bell. Uh, from memory, I think it's right. Maybe it was two seconds before, one second before. Uh, Taito Ivasa comes back off his losing streak to beat Stefan Struve, and he looks really good. He looks very technical. Uh, well, technical for his style. He didn't go in there swinging hammers. Uh, he put him on the cage, went for some clinch work there, and when he found the found the finishing blow, he put him away. Yeah, it was it was good. It was a good performance. Um, I'm I'm a massive Struve fan. I've always been a massive Struve fan. He's just not where he used to be anymore. He one of his his um you know kind of his his trades was that he was so absorbent. He was able to take shots. You need to pour pour him asleep to get rid of him. It was, and now he seems to curl up quite easy. And I thought, you know, we could. I think the referee could have let it go mm. to the end of the round, but he was not showing the signs of someone who wanted to fight and be in there. He was on the floor, you know, curled up. And and two of us there, he he needed that win because he was he was basically cut for a little while, wasn't he? And then they brought him back. So, um, huge win for him. Really good name to get on his record. And it was four fifty nine on the clock. So, um, you know, he he beat the buzzer on that one, and it, it was a great high highlight reel knockout on the main. Yeah, the main prelim spot. It was, it was brilliant. Yeah, the last fight on here I want to talk about before we move on to the, the next card coming up is uh, Nathaniel Wood versus Casey Kenny. Obviously, the fight of the night. What a war that was. I actually had Nathaniel Wood winning that one, but I'm not going to... It was a close fight, so uh, I don't think the decision was wrong by any means. But what a great war between two young bantamweight prospects. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was... I I personally had Casey Kenny, um, 29 to 8. I, I'll give him round one and round three. I thought, um, but as the fight was going on, one of my mates was betting on on um, Casey Kenny, and I was like, oh, Wood's got this. He seemed to be, in the second round, he seems to be coming on really strong, but Casey Kenny showed all the heart in the world to, to drag the fight to them, eke, out, eke it out, in my opinion. It was a brilliant fight. It was two guys who were perfectly matched. You know, you could watch that every week if, if they put it on. And um, the only issue I had is that the fact that someone scored a 30-27 for Kenny, I thought that was... A bit ridiculous. Um, a, a bit ridiculous, to say the least. It was a it was a really poor card, and it doesn't do justice to Nathaniel Wood, who was very competitive. As you said, you thought you won. I, I think a lot of people are split on this fight. So to score a 30-27 and act like Casey Kenny dominated the fight, it just... If you look at that card, then watch the fight, you're, gonna, you're just going to be baffled by it. So... Um, but you, obviously, it doesn't take away. I still had Casey Kenny. Brilliant performance. Both guys will, will go on. You know, it was a last-minute fight as well. So no one's stock really here. They'll both go on and, and fight good fights next. Absolutely. Unless you've got any of those other two, couple of prelims you want to touch on, we'll jump on to the next card. What do you think? Yeah. No, no one's the next one. Okay, no worries. We got UFC Fight Night, Hall vs. Silver. Obviously, Anderson Silver, the veteran, the one of the all-time greats. His final fight in the octagon, then he's calling it a day, he says. And he's taking on another striker in Uriah Hall. I expect this to be a really good fight, uh, technically. I think both guys are real technical kickboxers, so this should be really a, a joyful fight to watch on the feet. As far as who wins, I'm kind of torn on this one because Anderson Silva isn't what he used to be, right? We can both agree on that. But he still went three rounds with Israel Adesanya. So he's he's not a, he's not a scrub by any means, you know what I mean? I think the leg kicks might cause issues for him because you've seen that in the past. Um, but the other factor in this is Uriah Hall, while he's such a talented striker, once he gets into deep waters, sometimes he mentally checks out, and that usually costs him the fight. I mean, we look at the Polo Costa fight. He was having great success, um, and then he got tagged, and that was it, you know. Uh, so I don't know about this one. I think it's kind of 50-50 in my opinion. Do you have a hard pick on this? or? I'm, I'm going to go for Hall just because he, he's, he's young. He, well, he's younger. Um, 
I haven't seen any from 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 Anton Silva that suggests he's capable of beating someone over five rounds. You know, at this point in, in a while, um, even his win over Derek Brunson was very uninspiring. He he, it was more what Derek Brunson did do than what he did won, than what Silva did himself. Um, so I think Hall should be able to get it done. I, I do think it's a it's a good fight for Anton Silva, and if he comes out and is able to, you know. Turn back the clock. He's very capable of winning this. You know, even a few years down the line, you know, when he was fighting Bispin or, or people like that, he was still game. But he he's 45 now. And I think for Hall, um, even if it's Anderson Silver or not Anderson Silver, if you're not beating a 45-year-old who's lost, is it seven of the last eight, something like that? Yeah. He needs to say as he look at himself because he's being matched up against guys like Yo Romero and then he's matched up with Jacare as well. So if he wants to fight these guys and to continue fight these guys, you've got to take out Silva and you've got to take him out early. And you know, you know, he, he's known for highlight real knockouts. Get a high real knockout against Anderson Silva, one of the best the best fighters of all time. You know, you're sorted. Then then your next fight's secure. But I'm back in Hall because he should win, not that I'm, not because I'm very confident that he will win. I still think Anderson Silva has a chance because I don't particularly rate, you know, I don't particularly rate Hall as one of the best middleweights in the world. I think he's, you know, fringe top 15. I definitely think this is a better fight for him than the Uriah Hall, uh, sorry, Uriah Hall, Yoel Romero fight. Uh, I think that would have been a very dangerous fight for him, and I, I, I just didn't like that matchup at the slightest. I think this is a winnable matchup for him. I definitely do. Uh, over five rounds, not that I think it'll last five rounds. I think one of these guys is going to finish before the five. I actually predict it being quite early. So if I'm betting round betting, I'd probably go one or two. Um, yeah, one or two. I, I, I think one or two, yeah. Uh, but as far as a pick for me in this one, I'm going to take Uriah Hall as well, just because I think Uriah Hall's a fresher fighter. I think Anderson Silva, obviously, obviously is his last fight, is on the end of his career. And uh, I think it's a good move for him to call this one a day after this, because like you said, he's, he's lost a lot of his last fights. And um, yeah, I don't know how you Hall gets it done, but I believe Hall will get it done. Maybe it's by the leg kicks. That That's one thing that, has caused silver problems. I mean, Cannonier really just beat his legs up and that was it. So if you're you're Uriah Hall and you're looking at tape, that's that's your method to victory, isn't it? It's right there for you just to get into that one. Um, But yeah, aside from the main event on the card, the co-main event's a pretty impressive fight at featherweight between Andre Feely and Bryce Mitchell. Bryce Mitchell, all the the shine at the moment, the up-and-coming prospect. Andre Feely, been around for a long time, fought the best of the featherweights, fought uh, to, to both very success, right? I think this is a good test test for Mitchell, and I expect him to utilize his grappling pedigree and just get this one done. Yeah, I, I think this is one of them measuring stick fights where um, it's definitely the toughest test of Mitchell's career. Feely is one of them guys they like to throw in the youngsters in with, and um, it was Ch- Charles Jordan last time who came up short. He he was on the end of a split decision in a really fun fight, but then before that it was Saudi Yusuf and and guys like that. So they like to test the them against Feely and if they're not good enough they won't win um, but I think Bryce Mitchell's you know very much good enough I think he's very talented and um, if, if you're not able to resist them takedowns which I don't think Feely will be able to it's going to be a tough night on the floor and until someone can stop Mitchell taking them down he's going to continue to you know stretch that unbeaten record so really fun fight I think it'll be it'll be really fun and competitive but I think ultimately Mitchell will get the win yeah and this card's full of these uh I wouldn't say all up and coming, but full of these names that have a little bit of a name value behind them, but are really just in the building stages of their career. Because before that, we have Kevin Holland, who everyone knows because his last three fights and uh, against and he, who do you, he he finished uh, that dude with the spinning back kick, uh, Joaquin Buckley. So um, there's a yeah. connection there against uh, Mahmud Muradov, who I am not familiar with. But Kevin Holland, I'm excited to see him fight because he fights. Good fights, you know. He's, he's, he's a very talented grappler, but he doesn't use his grappling. He uses his long limbs to keep Philippe at bay, and he has power in his hands. So I'm interested to see how this test goes for him and if he can work himself into the rankings because he's still borderline 15. Yeah, it's, well, this is a late-notice fight, isn't it? I think um, he only he only pulled out to him not, lo- not long ago. Dim. It was Jocto, I think. So Holland steps up again. He continues to be, you know, the people's champ. He, he steps up. He takes a tough fight against someone like Muradov um, on late notice. I think he, and Jocto's fringe top 15 himself. So the winner of this can be, 
they're in a powerful position. I think this is a really good fight. And I expect Kevin Holland to win. I just think he's got a lot of momentum behind him. He's very talented. He's very big for the division. Um, and it, uh, every time I watch him, he impresses me. So I'm, it, I just don't think I'm able to pick against him in this one. Yeah, I tend to agree, and I don't know a lot about Muradov, so I'm not going to really go and break the X and O's down in this fight, but I do think Kevin Holland is a talented fighter, so if I see him on a card, I'm usually going to pick him. Uh, before this, we have a heavyweight matchup with, uh, I think it's a pretty good matchup, I didn't even know this was a thing until I'm looking at it right now, but Maurice Green, who's a, a bit of a, a interesting fighter, I'd say sometimes he has varied success, uh, but he obviously had that submission in one of his recent fights from the bottom. I think it was a head and arm triangle from the bottom from memory. Uh, taking on Greg Hardy, who we all know because he comes to the UFC and people wanted to see him lose, and he had a, a bit of a run there for a little while. Came up against Volkov and was definitely not ready for that challenge. He got outpointed and just defeated, but he didn't get finished in that one, so he's still showing he's, he's definitely not, not, not a scrub by any means. He definitely has power. So this fight's an interesting one. Can Green get him to the ground and submit him? Can Green outstrike him, or can Hardy land that power punch and put him away? What do you think? I think Greg Hardy should take this one. I expect him to land some power and get the knockout to him. Maurice Green, he got a win last time, but it was against John Valente, and um, Valente was... He's he's a he's a light heavyweight usually, and he come in you know with a a pot belly, and he was you know clearly out of shape, and and it was a it was a really fun fight to watch, but it was a really um, a sloppy fight really, and I thought Maurice Green, I was watching him, I was kind of one of them fights where I was frustrated because I felt like he could have made the fight much easier for himself just from my memory. I haven't watched it lately, but um, I feel like he's very hittable. I feel like. Uh, Greg Hardy he can get to him and you know whatever you want to say about Hardy he is powerful he's got some he's got some pop in them punches and um, he is a decent decent fighter especially in the heavyweight division which isn't the most stacked so I expect him I expect him to get an early KO against Green yeah I think you're probably right there I wouldn't dispute that one every time I picked against Hardy he's been oh except for Volkov every other time I picked against Hardy he's, he's shown up and put people away so I'm not going to take Maurice Green over Greg Hardy in this one. Uh, but opening up the main card, we have two lightweights uh, that I'm familiar with recently. Uh, Bobby Green obviously had that war with Lando Venado where he, he got the win there and looked pretty convincingly doing it. Tiago Moises, on the other hand, he, he got the win over Michael Johnson with that heel hook after Michael Johnson came out and looked fantastic. Looked like the Michael Johnson of old. Uh, second round began and Moises put him away with the heel hook. This is an interesting fight for me because I do think on the feet, Green is a much better boxer. And I think his striking is going to be the, the the main factor in this. Can Moises get him to the ground or grab a hold of his leg? I don't know. But it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. What do you think of this one? Yeah, I really like Bobby Green in this one. I think it's a good fight, you know, a good name. As you said, he's coming off a big win over Michael Johnson. Um, but Bobby Green, I just feel like he's got a lot of momentum right now, 34 years old. Clay Greed and Vanata and Alan Patrick on the bounce. I, I like I like where he, he where he's at in his career. I feel like he's he's improving as well because when he fought Lando Vanata originally, in my opinion, it was a draw split. But he, he lost the fight. You know he was lucky. I think Vanata got a point deducted. So he's clearly coming on and making leaps leaps in his game, and um, it's very apparent. And I think it'll it'll be very apparent come this weekend against Moses, who um, he he was able to get a sub, but. He weren't exactly impressive in that fight. He was getting bossed by Michael Johnson until he grabbed the leg, which, you know, I don't want to take anything away. It was a brilliant submission, but um, I think Bobby Green will be able to boss him and then not get caught. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on that. I think Green striking will be the difference maker in the fight. And I see him getting another win and climbing up the rankings, you know, because he's putting on a bit of a streak here, isn't he? So I'm interested to see that, interested to see what either of those guys does next. Now we'll jump onto news because we do have a few big things. I don't know what you want to start on, but I'm just going to pick the the, the most recent one and the, probably the biggest one. John Jones isn't happy about this Khabib goat talk, is he? John Jones thinks that it's disrespectful, thinks that he belongs at the number one spot because of his amount of title offenses he's had and the caliber of opponents he's had, and he's not interested in hearing Khabib being the number one. What are your thoughts? Is John Jones the number one or is Khabib, and why? In my opinion, neither of them are number one. I think GSP is the goat. I think he's um, very clear goat in my mind. You know, I know some people, the way they grade it is if you fail a test, you're not in in the conversation but you are you, I, in my opinion it still happened unless they take your wins away the, the, they're there so in my opinion it's GSP number one he, he's beat everyone he's faced basically even the guys he lost to he went be, back and beat him rematches and um, then John Jones number two 
I'd have Anderson Silva at number three and then probably Khabib at number four. That, that'd that be how I'd have I mean, it. I don't think um, Khabib, I think people like to get a, a bit carried away. As, as impressive as he is, he's had three really, really good wins. Um, besides that, it's not it's a not record full of you know monsters. He's had some good wins and he's had some very, very good wins, but... Um, I think I still think he he would need to you know rack together at least a few more wins before he's in the gold conversation. I kind of disagree with you, but I, I agree with a little bit of what you said there. I'll tell you my picks, and my number one is right now probably it's it's pretty close, but I would say Khabib my number one, and my reason for that being is because if you're talking about the the greatest of all time, pound for pound, if it's so, there's a distinction here. Are we talking about number one pound for pound, or are we talking about just the best fighter? in terms of their era and their division and whatnot. Because pound for pound, I think Khabib is by far the best. He's only ever lost one, maybe two rounds. He's looked incredible in every fight he's been in. He's undefeated. And if I, if everyone weighed the same and they had to fight each other based on their skill sets, I think Khabib would beat everyone there is just because of the dominance in his wrestling and his ability to get people to the ground. So that rules out the John Jones and the Anderson Silva. And the GSP is the one that is really up in the air for me because we could have seen that fight, but obviously we're not going to see it. Um, but I do have Khabib at number one for those reasons. Uh, John Jones and GSP are close second for me. Uh, it's hard to pick there because of the failed drug test for Jones. Uh, but aside from that, he's looked he's looked fantastic until recently. Recently, he's been coming uh, against uh, uh, quite a few challenges, and I just can't rank him about above Khabib because he's scraping these fights. His last two fights were like borderline close, and even before that, the Gustafsson fight, he he he's definitely like he's beatable. He hasn't been beaten yet, but he he's definitely human. He's definitely beatable. Whereas Khabib hasn't looked beatable. Khabib hasn't looked human. He's looked like a monster. Um, and as far as GSP goes, like you said, he's avenged both his losses. But at the same time, he's been through these wars and he's had close fights as well as Jones. So that's why I rank them both close second and third in either order you want to pick. And then Silver fourth. But I don't even have Silver up there, to be honest. I, I just think he's he's tarnished his career by staying around too long and taking all these losses. So I don't even think he's in the greatest of all time talk anymore. I would be more inclined to put Adesanya in there over Silver just because Adesanya has been unbeatable as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's my top three for sure. And I do have Khabib at the top. No, if, in my opinion, Khabib, the reason Jones is, and I'm going to defend him here, the reason Jones is, has looked vulnerable is because he's stuck around long enough to, to, you know, take out a whole old guard of fighters, then go on and face all the newcomers as well. And so, he, you know, if you stick around long enough, Khabib will look, you know, he'll have them test too. It's just because you get out early and you keep your O. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean much, I think. For me, it's not about um, styles and because... It, pound for pound is is kind of a, a, a like a not a not a great concept anyway because it takes away size where size is such a massive role you know for John Jones his size is such a, a big part of his game so to take that away from him and say okay he wouldn't have this attribute it, it, it makes no sense to me so I just go off resume and things like that and how they've looked in the fights I think Khabib has looked sensational since he grabbed the belt um. But he was a long road to the belt, and he and he he should have been there a bit earlier, in my opinion. He's he's had his his, his record, you know. Even he got it against Ali Aya Quinta, the the belt, which is not not the best win either. But he's got Rafael de Sonia's and Edson Barboza, the good wins. But I just don't think he's got done enough to 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 get that yet. But in my opinion, he could be there. It's just unfortunate we were not going to see him, you know, go on and beat someone like Vergs and Regor or face St. Pierre and cement his place as GOAT because he's very close. He's, very, he's you know, top four, as I said, but I, I just feel like he's got to do more and, and unfortunately he's not going to. Yeah, and I think you're right in saying that if he stuck around and fought GSP, if he beat GSP, that would be it. There would be no conversation um, because if you're knocking out one of the other two people, or one of three people in the goat talk, like you're definitely cementing yourself as number one. Um, but I do think he's getting out the right time to to keep his legacy because like Jones, I, I agree with what you're saying here. Jones has stuck around and people kind of know what Jones is doing. His styles say he, he's pretty, he's a very, very well founded, well, well, uh, well-rounded fighter. I can't say what I'm saying. But he's stuck around so long. People have worked out where he's strongest and they're taking him out of that realm and working out how to beat him. 
people have been doing that for Khabib for the for the longest time because he's been so dominant as a wrestler. But if he stuck around to 50 and 0, I'm sure someone would be able to solve that puzzle, uh, whether it be Ferguson or anyone else. Uh, I agree with what you're saying there. I just think right now Khabib's number one. Might be re- recency bias, but we'll move on to some more news. And the other thing I have here that is a big thing from throughout the week that we didn't get a chance to speak about last time, Leon Edwards, talking about rankings, Leon Edwards got kicked out of the rankings for not taking fights, then offered a Chimaev fight, takes the Chimaev fight, and he's straight back in. What are your thoughts on that? It's it's just so weird. Like I, I can only assume that Leon Edwards has been turning down every fight, like a lot of fights. I've seen the report where he's apparently turned down three massive fights. So if if that's true, and he's turned down Usman and Covington and and Chimiev, then I probably I probably agree with r- ripping him from the rankings. But he's back in. I think this is actually a good fight for. For Edwards, I think it is disrespectful, really, to him because he shouldn't be fighting someone who's unranked. But Leon Edwards is just dying for some hype. And it, what what more hype can you do at, at the moment? If Covington and Masvidal don't want to fight, yeah, what more hype can you get than taking out Chimiev? And I think it, you know, on paper, does it? It should be like it's an easier fight than Wonderboy because Wonderboy is proven talent. Chimiev is not is not a proven talent, and he could be just out of his death against Leon Edwards, and Ian Edwards could make Leon Edwards could make him look silly. So he gets a headline fight. I'm sure he gets a nice payday. He gets the chance to you know gain some credit back in his career because it's been so long without him fighting. You know we all see the jokes if you're in the MMA community. You see the jokes that are made about him not wanting to fight and avoiding fights. So now he's taking on the big monster who no one else wants to fight. Here's his chance. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I do. I did read a report that said he had turned down fights with Cummington, Usman, Wonderboy, Jeff Neal, and Chimaev. So that's five. So I, I still don't like ripping him from the rankings, right? Like maybe put it, take him down the rankings, but take him fully out. It was such a negotiation tactic to get him to say yes to this fight, and it worked. And I do agree with what you're saying because. Well, when Chimaev came to the UFC and did what he did to John Phillips, we thought he was a monster. We thought he was incredible. But we've seen someone else recently do that to John Phillips too. So maybe that's a problem on John Phillips' part. And then his second fight, he fought Reese McKee, who's a lightweight coming up to welterweight in his debut fight. And he's a striker predominantly. And so he was able to do the grappling again. But can he do that to someone like uh, Leon Edwards, who... As far as his grappling is not the greatest, he's got submissions. He's got skills to defend takedowns. Maybe Shemaev's uh, grappling ability isn't what we think it is. And maybe Edwards will be able to expose that. And on the feet, I think I haven't seen anything from Shemaev aside from one punch. So I can't really like critique his striking. But Edwards is a very talented striker. And I feel like it's definitely a winnable fight. Yeah, it's very winnable. It's a very nice fight as well because... Um, how how good is Jimmy Evan? If he's he's if he's what the reputation says, he's gonna go out and he's gonna blast Edwards regardless anyway. But there's no evidence to say that Jimmy Evan is this beast everyone's hyping him up to be. There's not there's no evidence at all because, as you said, Reese McKee was a lightweight on seven days' notice. He had no chance. He was just a body. John Phillips, as we've seen lately, maybe one of the worst grapplers in in a in the middleweight division. You know. I don't think that's unfair to say. He he got out, out grappled by a guy who's known as a striker just last week. Um, the Mershart one was a bit overhyped in the sense that Mershart is not... He's fringe. He's probably top 20 at, at middleweight. Um, so his best win is over a 20th rank middleweight, which as impressive as it was, Leon Edwards is, is a genuine title contender. He's beat genuine... You know, genuine guys at the top of welterweight, and he deserves his three ranking as ranking at number three. He really does deserve it. I think it's a really good fight for him. I think he steals all this hype. I think he, if, he, if he's able to beat them, and I'm sure the UFC have probably said, fight them and you'll get a shot. I'm sure they've said something along them. They've, they've said what they need to say to get him in there. So I'm excited for it. I, I didn't like it originally. I think it is disrespectful, but at this point, I'm a Lee Edwards fan and it's getting hard to defend them because you just want to see him fight. So just fight and what better way to do it than against Chimiev who no one else wants to fight. No, you're absolutely right. And I guess on December 19th, we'll definitely see where Shemaev is in terms of skill because if he gets through Leon Edwards, that's title shot right there in my opinion. Uh, I don't think he jumps Burns, but he's definitely like 
one shot away from one fight away from the title. Uh, that's all the news I had there. Did you have anything else you wanted to touch on before we wrap it up? Oh, no, I do, I do no, have one thing. I have one thing. I, f- I forgot about this, man. Um, maybe just because I'm a big fan of both fighters, I want to bring it up. But uh, there's rumors that What's his name? Marlon Cheeto Vera is taking on Jose Aldo at UFC 255 in November. What are your thoughts on that matchup? Should it should it go through? And who would you have going into that one? Yeah, it's a, it's a really it's a really fun fight. That one, um, it's tough. It's it's a tough one because Aldo, I still think he's he's very capable. Like even in the on fight, eventually he got dominated and it was a bit brutal. But at the start, he, he's a live dog, and I, I I feel like in round one, maybe round two, he he he'd be really um, competitive. And then as the fight would progress, as long as Cheeto can hang in and, and deal what's coming at him, he might be able to get him. It depends what, what type of... Is it a headline fight? Is it three rounds? No. I, that really three does rounds. play a part in. It, is it, if it's three rounds, I, I do fancy Aldo over three rounds. I think he'll be able to um, outpoint him, get a, get a lead and then and a, a barrage at the, at the end of um, round three. But it's a really fun fight. It's a great fight for Cheeto, you know. He, he got hard done by with that um, loss to Yudong a while ago, but then he just stole all of O'Malley's thunder, and now he gets such a massive fight against a legend who's who's still quite highly ranked as well. So, great, great fight. Yeah, I'm very excited for Cheeto to get this opportunity. Should it actually happen? I mean, this is just rumor at the moment. There's been nothing confirmed uh, that I know of anyway. Um, but you got to think, the one thing I'm thinking is, could you imagine if O'Malley got past Cheeto and they booked O'Malley versus Aldo? That would be a main event on a fight night for sure. Like, there's no doubt. And could you imagine the spectacle behind that uh, compared to this, which is going to be on UFC 255 if the rumors are true, which they may not be. Um, but then it will be three rounds. I just think that the... The O'Malley versus Aldo fight would have been huge, especially for the comparisons with McGregor had on uh, O'Malley being able to get past Cheeto. But uh, yeah, it's not like we're going to see that. No, O'Malley's got a lot of work to do right now. Like um, that was a that was a bad loss, and it was a it was a bad loss just in just for credit as well in terms of how he looked. And um, you know, we've seen people survive that injury. We've seen people survive that injury and win. Um, he he curled up and um, it's not it's not great for credit and then also the post fight stuff. I feel like he needs to sh- show his toughness in the next fight. I think they need to give him a, a, another killer and um, he needs to show that he's a proper fighter because it, he he's one of them fighters who's who's going on credit like credit and people hyping him and all the hype's gone and someone like Jimmy turns up who's a beast ripping through everyone calling people out left and right. MMA fans do gravitate towards that tough man style and I don't think O'Malley showed that yet so I hope he comes back and, and looks fantastic but in the meantime Cheeto although that's a brilliant brilliant fight absolutely and we'll wrap it up there guys thanks for watching and we'll speak to you next week to wrap up all the action from the fights and uh, recap all the latest news thanks guys